Third Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandu Kumalo. This is episode 19 of the podcast, and we're, of course, on day 42 of the national lockdown. Now, as many of us have seen that COVID-19 has had an effect not just on residential properties, especially if you're a tenant or a landlord, perhaps you've already made arrangements with your tenants, or if you're a tenant, you've already started speaking with your landlord. This has also had an effect on the commercial property sector. And tonight we'll be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the commercial property sector and some of the opportunities and threats that this global pandemic has caused in the sector and helping us to understand and unpack what some of the effects have been and perhaps even what some of the opportunities are. I am joined by Estienne Declar, who's the spokesperson for the property industry group. He's also uh, chairman of the SA REIT Association and we'll speak a little bit about what REITs are and some of the opportunities um, in the REIT space as well as the CEO of Growth Point South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us, Estienne. Uh, this evening. Thanks for having me. So I think let's first just start with, you know, some of the, and, and, and I was saying to you before we went on that this has probably been such a, a difficult time for different commercial landlords um, as they find probably some of their tenants either struggling to make rental payments and of course having to deal with some of the effects of the COVID-19 in South Africa and commercial tenants potentially not being able to make some of the rental. I know that this week, um, as, a, as a group uh, that has different stakeholders from your SAPOA um, and other players, you've gotten together and essentially have a guideline on some of the relief and you've even extended uh, some of the relief to some of the you know, different players. Could you just take us through what some of those have been uh, that are essentially geared at making um, things slightly easier for some of the tenants and also ensuring that, of course, course, the landlords are also financially covered as much as possible and can weather the storm that this pandemic has essentially found us in. Yes, thank you. So in the beginning of uh, or the middle of March, uh, we effectively, uh, what was a simple little WhatsApp group of a couple of landlords effectively blossomed into the representative kind of body for commercial real estate in South Africa. And what we did was we effectively got uh, SAPOA, which is the Property Owners Association, as well as the Shopping Center Council of South Africa, and the SA REIT Association, which is the representative association for all the listed property companies uh, together, as well as a whole bunch of private, um, private property owners. So it really is an owner's uh, representative body and the idea was to initially was just to deal with let's say some of the challenges the practical challenges that we were facing as shopping center owners as example how to provide security how to provide hygiene services how to you know manage some of the challenges the operational challenges that that we would have faced I mean at that stage nobody contemplated uh, any lockdown and that came actually very briefly within a week after us actually getting together. Uh, the lockdown really came in. And at that point, we were working closely with government to try and expand or at least try and uh, assist our customers, being the shoppers ultimately, to try and get uh, the right list of essential services or as broad a list, if you'd like, uh, uh, of essential services in the lockdown period. So. The reality is, is that um, what ensued after that was pretty messy for the real estate industry. And, uh, you know, there is this perception that uh, landlords are these big uh, ogres that have copious amounts of money. And uh, they don't, they're not really seen as businesses, really, to be honest. And uh, that, in fact, isn't quite the case. So when you think about uh, landlords, the South African property industry is probably one of the largest, most proliferated industries in the country with players, literally uh, one man bands with one property right up to very, very large companies like a growth point, which has assets in excess of 160 billion rand. You know? So you do have a very wide church of different owners. And uh, the, the reality is, is that each one of them have sort of different dynamics and different problems that we have to deal with. But ultimately, uh, what happened was that most of the retail tenants decided they weren't going to pay their rent, whether they could or not. That wasn't really the case. But uh, most uh, what the sort of antidotal level of collections were for April was around about 30 to 40 percent. Of rentals were collected. Now, to give you an idea, to run a shopping center, your cost to 
your cost to income ratio before you even service debt or any other administrative costs is in excess of 40 percent so the reality is from day one you know many of the landlords were in a deficit they were funding on on the on the one side they're busy funding those same retailers that are their clients they're busy funding their rates and taxes their water and lights etc and uh, the the real estate industry's costs are pretty fixed so if you think the biggest cost for us as an industry is uh, our rates and taxes that we have to pay on behalf of we collect it from our tenants but then pay it to the municipalities uh, we also have the water and lights and all those administrative costs of opt you know of operating costs today. It's a big issue. Yeah. First debt, and we've got people to employ. We're one of the biggest direct and indirect employers in the country, in that clearly all the services industries like security and cleaning, uh, they all work for our industry. And yeah. um, so all these costs are pretty sticky, and uh, and obviously now you don't have income. So liquidity is a very big thing for all the landlords at the moment, and we are basically muddling through what is quite unprecedented uh, sort of scenarios, which has been nearly forced onto the South African economy. So it is quite unique to close down the economy, and uh, I think that maybe the reality is maybe government has underestimated how fragile that economy is. Uh, we've seen both our airlines go into business rescue. And, uh, and I'll tell you what I know of a couple of other companies. So we've had Edcon, which is a big retailer. They've also gone into, into business rescue already. And I think there will be other retailers that are shortly on their heels and other companies. So it's not just uh, the retail industry. It's not just the, uh, the, the commercial property industry, but various other industries in our country. So we, we're very concerned about the impact that it is having on our economy. The reality is we've dealt with, uh, we came together and decided, look, as an industry, we can uh, watch our tenants uh, suffer or we can proactively come together and see whether we can convince pretty much most of the players in the sector to, to provide some relief to our clients and big focus on SMEs and protecting jobs. So what we did there was we, we brought to, uh, into life something called the assistance and relief package or guideline. Uh, and how these guidelines work is effectively the, the relief is offered to tenants in two forms. One is actual discounts. So in other words, if you owed 100 rand for rental for the month, you know, the small SME might be given off the whole 100 rand, never to be recovered by the landlord. The other form of relief. And I that, saw that, that, you know, you've essentially broken it down to that 100% discount, um, certainly for, I think it was for April. And then for May, it was a perhaps, you know, 50% discount if they event that the landlord can afford more, then they can extend more. And I think you're looking essentially at a two to three month period. So you so we've actually extended it now to three months. Uh, uh, in So uh, at April, May and June. And, and June. the reason is, is, I think realistically, we don't expect you know, everything to be back to normal the day lockdown stops. And as we've seen practically uh, with level four and all these different levels, which creates quite a lot of uncertainty, to be honest, um, you know, things will take a little while to become, uh, to come back to normal. But in terms of the liquidity that, that is offered back into the industry, uh, into the retailers, I mean, that, if you take it across all the landlords, must be valued at over three to four billion rand worth of either debt relief or uh, uh, rental relief or, or um, you know, moving rental payments later. So, and actually acting like, the, like a banking facility to those, to those, um, those different retailers. And, and the landlords also could agree to do that interest-free, which is yeah. quite unique. Uh, I mean, we do incur interest. So, the, the fact is, is we are actually funding the retailers in this process. And what we have done is it's not just the smallest retailers, but we've taken this all the way through to even the largest retailers. So we're busy negotiating with uh, the big clothing retailers, some of the other big retailers uh, in the malls. And uh, clearly, you know, this is a process. It's, the, it's a big job uh, if you've got lots and lots of tenants to get through this whole lot. But the idea was to offer them real relief in this very difficult time over the three month period. Now, the reality is, is a good deal is probably where everybody is either equally happy or equally unhappy. And uh, 
if you if you're not trading as a retailer, you know, yeah. you, I think uh, any payments, whether it is to your suppliers or to your landlords, which is also really a supplier of yours, uh, is uh, is a difficult thing to get across because you're looking after your own liquidity in this time. Yeah. But what we have kind of managed to do, I think, there is some. Uh, a sharing of the pain concept that that is kind of finding favor with both parties and you know we've just been on the front foot as the real estate industry to, to actively publish what we prepare to do and how much money we actually can afford to put on the table and I, I think that must be the only industry in the country I can honestly tell you I don't know of any other industry that's actually willing to live in, right? which yeah. is another bizarre and unprecedented thing but we times the, the the sort of ethos of ubuntu that that the industry is bringing to the market and i've actually been surprised at the level of goodwill coming out of the industry you know because uh when government asked for testing sites for instance for uh, you know testing te uh, temporary testing sites uh yeah. i think the list at the moment is over 330 different sites offered uh for free to government you know where they can run testing sites and the, the reality is, is I think from the industry's perspective, yeah, it's not like we have infinite capital to be able to do it. We've also got businesses to run. Many of the guys have uh, have debt against these investments, and uh, and they they in a very precarious position. So equally to some of the retailers that that you know uh, didn't really trade and have a difficult time, I think the real estate sector also has a very very difficult uh, hurdle to get across, and it'll take us maybe many years to, to get past the damage that's been done currently. If you're just joining us at home, I'm speaking to Estienne de Clark, who's the spokesperson for the Property Industry Group, is also chairman of the South African REIT Association, as well as the CEO of Growth Point South Africa. And we're talking about some of the opportunities and threats to the commercial property sector, given the impact of COVID-19 on the sector. Now, Estienne, I see that uh, you know, you've essentially excluded certain types of commercial properties from some of these um, you know, relief uh, you know, sentiments, whether it's, you know, de uh, discounting by 100% or 50%, or whatever the case is, some of them include your offices, your logistics, your warehouse, your industrial healthcare, hospitality. Um, can you just take us through, you know, some of the, the reasoning behind why those are excluded? I know that you, you know, you've said that those should essentially approach their landlords, um, and the landlords should deal with them on a case by case basis. But I think for me, or for even our viewers at home, it would be interesting to just get a sense of why it is that they were actually almost taken aside a little bit to say, we know that you might also have challenges, but you should actually have a, a more proactive conversation with your landlords um, individually. Yeah, you know, so I think the, the main reason for that is really that it's very difficult to get a one size fits all for the whole economy, right? And, and I think just to classify the properties, I mean, we're talking here, literally anything from hospitality right through to healthcare. Uh, there might be some residential in there. There's also definitely, you know, other commercial forms like office and industrial. Now, the reality is, is every single uh, tenant has its own dynamics in, in those sectors. And, um, and the reality is, is that probably the, in those sectors, the, the relief is less required. Uh, but there will be certain people, let's say, in the supply chain of retailers, for example. Now, none of the retailers are paying the supply chain at this stage. So we know that those, those, that component of the market is under, you know, severe pressure. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I know that the, the, the different uh, uh, property owners will definitely look favorably at assisting those tenants in this difficult time. The... The reality is, is that that retail was is quite unique in that obviously it, it's it's got specific dynamics and you're dealing with with a uh, a limited amount of different clients so it's quite manageable and you can do kind of one size fits all so what we've done there is we've excluded the national uh, retailers the food retailers the essential retailers so we haven't offered them relief clearly all the pharmaceutical the pharmacy groups. Uh, have also been excluded. So the essentials effectively are excluded because the reality is we don't have infinite ability to help everybody. So we've had to make some really tough calls to say, 
look, those that can pay must pay. And those that are suffering the most, we're going to try and help you the most. So we've, we've split even the SMEs between highly impacted and, and, and let's call it medium impacted. And they get different levels of relief. Then we get medium sized retailers and then clearly the large retailers. And we've tiered the, the love, if you'd like, and spread it across everybody. But, you know, obviously with more uh, concern uh, being levied against the smaller guys and, and less love being spread to the bigger guys. The reality is everybody wants to pay nothing. So wow. that, that is, a, is, 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 you know, the, the sort of uh, position. Now, I think that, uh, you know, realistically, that, that isn't uh, a solution for anybody. And I think we've made good progress with what we've done. There is a much better understanding on both sides of yeah. each other's situation. And I do think that in many respects, you know, many retailers and landlords have found each other by the efforts of, of the property industry group where we've put out these guidelines. So it just makes discussions so much easier. And, um, and I think it's also helped many very desperate retailers. So we've been inundated with unbelievable, uh, wonderful messages voice notes and uh, mails, you know, from clients uh, thanking, thanking uh, the property industry uh, uh, owners, you know, for, for what they have been prepared to do. And um, I think the reality is, is that, you know, moving forward, we are concerned clearly as an industry. Uh, the, we have got businesses to run. You can't infinitely help clients uh, through, through this difficult period. So I think, you know, you've got like a three-month window after yeah. which I think even we as an industry, and we have undertaken to pay all our staff, pay all our suppliers, and also continue paying our interest as well as the rates and taxes. Now, one of the biggest challenges for the industry over the past 10 years has been the unbelievable disproportionate increase in administrative costs. Yeah. And if you're a tenant, you've got this perception that landlords are making so much money because look how my rent has grown. But when you analyze your bill actually very carefully, you would have, would have noticed that the rent actually hasn't grown at all just about. And in fact, that what we the have seen- The rates and taxes, have at a higher percentage than- Well, the rates and taxes rate. over the past 10 years have grown with 559%. Now that's effectively annualized growth of 10.5% per year. Now that is way in excess. Now, I mean, we are, I'm currently busy with, with uh, my, our own budgets and I can tell you, the local municipalities have uh, indicated that the, the rates are going up uh, double digit again. Now, the, the reality is what, what's happening is that um, the percentage of operating cost is now disproportionate. And in fact, there are examples where tenants are now paying more in rates and taxes per square meter than they are paying in, for, in, in certain shopping centers. So we know that that's not sustainable. We, we see a train smash coming. And um, unfortunately, local government has become too expensive for the people. And on top of that, what has happened for the commercial property sector is we're increasingly picking up the responsibility to provide services. So if you don't have, uh, if you're a tenant in an office building or industrial property, and you don't get water consistently, or if you don't get electricity consistently, you're going to ask the landlord for uninterrupted power or water tanks. Increasingly, mm -hmm. we're having to provide that at all our facilities. I mean, in Cape Town, when there was the water crisis, um, I mean, Growth Point on its own spent 50 million rand in providing alternative water sources at, at various buildings. Now, those, that money has to come from somewhere and it's not really earning a return, right? And yeah. it's very difficult to recover. So, give you another example. I mean, provincial before, road. Um, before of, you, you, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. I said before you give us that other example, I actually wanted to take um, a quick break um, and our viewers at home will be back just shortly. I am, of course, in conversation with Estienne Declar, who's a spokesperson for the property group, uh, the property industry group, as well as the CEO of Growth Point. And after the break, Estienne, I actually want us to have a conversation around SA REITs. I mean, I, I know some of our viewers at home might not be familiar with what REITs are almost a high level, what are REITs, um, and perhaps how they've been affected. I mean, we've been having certainly different conversations when we're talking property around the impact that REITs um, or the impact on REITs um, in the past couple of months. And we've seen that some of them weren't already performing well prior to COVID-19. So it's not as though the bad performance is necessarily um, because of the pandemic. So almost looking at why is it performing so badly, is that still um, you know, a viable investment 
you know, channel for people to actually look in. And I'm sure we'll even have a conversation around retail another time because it's one of those topics that need to be unpacked um, quite extensively. But I think for purposes of today, we want to actually look at how they've specifically been also affected by the um, COVID-19 pandemic. If, to our viewers at home, we're going to be back just after this. Of course, we are talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the commercial property sector. Welcome back to the Pro Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantunga Kumalo. Tonight, I'm speaking to Estienne de Clark, who's the spokesperson for the Property Industry Group, as well as chairman of the SA REIT Association and CEO of Growth Point South Africa. We're talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the commercial property sector. And before the break, we're essentially talking about the different ways that this pandemic has essentially affected, you know, the different players and some of the, the some of the ways that the different players have also tried to make it um, better for their respective tenants. And taking into consideration, I think, you know, it's in one of the things that you actually mentioned that I wasn't aware of is, is how, uh, and you mentioned it just before we went to the break, that in, in certain um, commercial spaces or some of the retail spaces that some of your members have, they're essentially paying more for municipal uh, for the municipality bill per square meter than they're paying uh, for rental, which is actually quite shocking. I mean, especially when you consider that you can't escalate rental by 18 or 20 percent. I mean, that 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 isn't also a sustainable increase. But before we went to the break, I also said I actually want us to talk a little bit about um, REITs. And I think almost at a, if you had to tell a grade three student what REITs are, um, how would you best describe them and how they actually work? Sure. So let's start with a name. Clearly, REIT sounds like something that should be growing in a river, right? If you're speaking of <laughs> plants, so, uh, yeah. I can understand the confusion. Uh, it's an acronym for Real Estate Investment Trusts. Now, the reality is none of these companies are actually trusts, but it's like uh, the OMO of washing powder. You know, it's a name that uh, is allocated to the real estate industry that have a certain tax dispensation. Yeah. Now, what are these vehicles designed to do or these companies? They effectively aggregate property investments and they earn rental. They have some expenses. Normally, they have some debt. And then every six months, they are designed to pay investors all the profit that they make. So they are equivalent of actually investing into the direct property. So if you buy a growth point share, then you will have a little piece of the Victoria and Alfred waterfront. You'll have a little piece of Discovery's head office. So effectively, it gives you exposure to the underlying real estate and you're getting the net cash flow. And with the tax per dispensation for REITs that we negotiated with National Treasury, and which is an internationally recognized kind of tax dispensation for REITs, uh, you don't have, uh, you have much better tax efficiency. So the entity itself uh, gets a deduction and pay all the payments to its investors is tax free and the investor actually picks up the tax bill. So that it's, a, it's very efficient from, from a tax point of view. There's no double taxation. And then the other thing is, is you know, if we sell a property, there's no capital gains tax in the vehicle. So it's, it's quite tax efficient from, from, a, from that point of view. And it's really designed to be very accessible to the man in the street as an investor. So most of us, if we've got a bit of money and you think, okay, well, I want property investment, then you think obviously of a house, uh, to maybe rent out or maybe a holiday flat even. Now, those obviously are, have got their place in your investment portfolio. But, you know, commercial property through REIT is very accessible. You don't need huge quantities of money. You know, if you had to go and buy the v &A, you would have to pull out uh, 20 billion rand or something today. So not all of us <laughs> have that in our credit card. So I mean, if somebody's got that kind of credit card, I'd like <laughs> them to find it. <laughs> <laughs> we all wish, right? So you have to dream, you know? So the, yeah. the reality is you can get access to that property by yeah. buying, let's say, a, a share uh, in, in Growth Point. Or, you know, there are various other REITs uh, on the market. There's some that focus just on industrial properties. There's some that focus on where, uh, small warehousing spaces, self-storage. Uh, there's various different uh, niches, including retail. Most of us uh, increasingly also have offshore exposure. So, you know, it really offers investors a very simple, transparent way to invest. Now, I think one of your questions was, why have they been performing so badly over the past two years? Mm. Now, the reality is, is that if you go and contextualize how they perform relative to the rest of the economy, 
there's a very similar correlation. Now, believe it or not, actually the South African economy has been terrible for a couple of years, right? Um, no, we have. I mean, the, when we look at our growth levels, they haven't uh, been where we potentially like them to be. I mean, in certain instances, below 2%. Um, I think there are certain instances where we're not even reaching the target that government had set. So I, it, it hasn't been where we'd like it. I, I think we would be lucky if we're looking at growth anywhere close to double digits, but obviously we're so far away from that, that uh, we kind of have to almost readjust uh, some of our expectations when it comes to certain returns. Sure, I think and that is obviously disappointing. But if you can understand the real estate business, what is it really? It's offering space to clients who rent it. And it's also a demand and supply kind of dynamic, you know. So if uh, if there's too much office space and clients are shrinking, like what we see at the moment, so companies are not increasing their employment, they're actually decreasing their employment, then clearly there's too much office space. Then what happens? The price drops per square meter. And the counter is true. Is if the economy is growing, uh, I mean, we had a, a kind of a nice window from, let's say, 2004 through to 2008, which we saw really strong growth in South Africa uh, up to the World Cup. And I mean, at that stage, you know, the REITs were doing 15% growth in distribution year and year, you know. So that was the sort of pinnacle. Uh, the reality is, is you are seeing quite a keen correlation with what's happening in the economy. And these REITs can't, um, let's say, um, step out of line with what's happening in the fundamental dynamics of of demand and supply. So there are certain sectors, for instance, industrial at the moment, which still is, is reasonably resilient and, and, and doing quite, uh, still reasonably well, but certainly retail and office, uh, they, over the past few years, they've really struggled as, as those sectors have come, come under, under pressure. So the reality is, is, do I think it's a good investment? I do think it is a good investment over the long term. Uh, can't deny that at the moment, uh, you know, South African economy is in a bit of a shambles. And yeah. hopefully, you know, if we work together as a country uh, and, uh, and you know, put our shoulder to the grindstone and work, to, work with each other to, to try and grow the, the, the economy, then certainly, you know, the property industry will perform pretty well as well. We've got a question coming in. So if you've got any questions um, at home, you're more than welcome to send them through and Estienne will be able to respond. Estienne, this one is coming in from Bruno Santos who, who says, uh, he starts off with a comment saying, commercial property moving towards shopping centers. Rent has been quite expensive for the companies needing shop space. They have decreased space to try um, mitigate the rental costs, but yet new centers keep being built. Post COVID nineteen, won't this be more difficult for shops and restaurants to rent? Yeah, so I think uh, firstly, just to come back to the comment of that rent is so expensive. I think the cost of occupation is has become expensive, but I don't think necessarily rent. And that comes to my earlier comment that we've seen rates and taxes, electricity and utilities grow so exponentially, and it's really that that is putting quite a lot of pressure on uh, on the tenants, right? Um, over, I, I can tell you in office and, in, and even in industrial, the real growth in rental has been absolutely nominal uh, over the past uh, five years. And that's the same for retail. In, in fact, at the moment, both, I would suggest, are ticking sort of negative on the rental line. But as I mentioned, you know, rates and taxes, double digit growth. So that is one of the biggest things. And as an industry, we will be taking up that with the Minister of Cooperative Governments. In terms of the new shopping centers, unfortunately, the only uh, real catalyst to these new shopping centers are one, council providing rights to those shopping centers to be developed. So we've got very loose planning regimes in South Africa. And as a result, you've seen exponential growth of uh, shopping center development. The second thing is, is that the, the large retailers all commit to these new developments. Now, I do think in the current environment that will slow down. And, you know, those have actually been more negative for the property owners than they have actually been for the tenants, because the dynamic is as if you continually opening up a new shopping center next door, the trading in, in the shopping center gets diluted in the existing one. So we have seen uh, that competition coming on. And, and what you find is you might have had a good shopping center in an area that's well serviced. Now you've got two medium 
poorly performing shopping centers and, and both are struggling. So I do foresee that uh, both in office, commercial and industrial, and even in all the other sectors, that development will probably slow down uh, in the current environment, maybe for a couple of years, uh, as, as we kind of have to work through the, the damage that's been done through this COVID period. And I was actually about to ask you that, and I, and I see Bruno actually added, um, you know, a certain component to his question where he says, uh, won't it be more difficult to build new shopping centers sort of post COVID-19? And it essentially speaks to what you're saying. I mean, are you, are you anticipating, given the, the economic climate that we find ourselves in, and I suppose the various communities that we have in South Africa, do you see instances where there might be a rise in certain shopping centers in certain markets somewhere in the country? Because we're already seeing, especially in your townships and even rural areas, that there's over there's an oversupply in certain instances of um, shopping complexes to the point where you know some of them might perform well, perhaps for a few months, but then they you know slowly start being empty. Where are you seeing um, that essentially going within the shopping centres in particular? Yeah, so I think just to understand the investment model, so. The investment model is obviously, if you get the tenants, they sign leases, yeah. you can build the building, it has to offer a certain return to the investor. And then obviously a big component to this is also bank funding. Yeah. Uh, and, and you need nearly all three of those components to work together. Now in the current environment, I don't think the rentals will justify the development of too many uh, new developments in any of the sectors. And the risk for any investor is to the extent that they get the tenants to pay higher rentals to justify that development. Within five years, they're going to suffer big losses with rentals going backwards. So I think any astute investor will say, look, you know, I'd rather pretty much sit on what I've got now. And in, in our country, we don't have a positive spread between the cost of debt and, and the yield or the return on the investment. So if you go and look at, let's say in Europe, you can buy an asset for 7% and you're funding it at 2% of interest. And in South Africa, the cost of debt is probably, it's come down obviously in the short term rates, but your long bond yields and your long funding is still probably around nine, nine and a half ish. And the yields on these investments, you're struggling to, to build it and get a a nine percent yield. Yeah, double digit yield, especially in so from that point of view, yeah. the new developments don't make sense. I think the value really lies in what I would call second hand or existing shopping centers or yeah. existing office buildings and existing uh, industrial facilities. And I do believe that you know over time those investments will perform reasonably well if you if you're patient as an investor. And and to the extent that you're investing into REITs, you know, it's quite transparent getting professional management with that you have a diversification in your investment so if you go and buy one building or one uh, uh, um, let's say residential unit then you're quite exposed to that one uh, that one tenant or the dynamics for that one specific investment whereas most of these companies have at least a level of diversification some of them even have across sectors others have even across jurisdictions so yeah you know, of course, countries. yeah so you're getting a very broad diversification and, and you know, this COVID sort of uh, experience really shows uh, the sort of risks uh, in concentration. So, I mean, uh, you know, for the past uh, five years that we've been invested in the VNA, it's been the most amazing investment you can ever imagine. Uh, and we've been able to develop out that asset, but it has probably been the most hardest hit asset in South Africa under COVID regulations because it's closed down all the restaurants, the whole tourism industry is closed down around it and, and half of the, the shopping center, which is one of the biggest components of the Victoria and Alfred waterfront has been predominantly shut down as well. So it is busy emerging now, but even the tourism sector, you know, so it helps to diversify your investments and, and by investing into uh, these REITs, you know, a small investor can literally invest a couple of hundred grand a month and get a huge diversification across uh, different components of the South African sector. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely do um, agree with that one. I, I, I also invest in REITs. Um, the, and I mean, I also have 
actual investment properties. And you tend to find that with REITs, the, the amount is substantially lower. And if you're servicing multiple bonds, that's obviously higher. Then you're paying rates, then you're paying levies. Whereas the, the REITs component of the investment is the lowest. The returns are relatively decent. And because I'm taking a long-term view, uh, you know, in many ways in my portfolio, you can afford to take that minor dip. Um, and we'll see how the recovery will be in the subsequent years. Estienne, I'm going to let you go, but before we do, you know, any last words to any to our viewers at home about the state of the commercial property sector and, and, and where you potentially see it going, especially in the post-COVID-19 world? Yes, so look, I mean, clearly in the months of April and May, and it will probably roll into June a little bit, I think it's going to be difficult for, for the sector across the board. Uh, but I do see it emerging uh, and, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll emerge with the economy because clearly we're dependent on each other. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, we'll be able to work through the short term pain and, and offer investors long term gain. So the reality is, is that, you know, the, the, the sector is very correlated to what's happening across the world at the moment. And whether you in South Africa, Australia or Eastern Europe, we've certainly seen those experiences being actually very similar because most of the governments have taken the same sort of stance on how to deal with this crisis. Um, I think the, the situation in South Africa is bigger than just the COVID crisis. I think we've got certain structural economic challenges and those will take you know some certainly tough medicine to, to get us through it. But I do believe as a sector, you know, South Africa's real estate sector has been one of its most competitive sectors globally, um, you know, and, and it's been one of the areas that's been uh, growing strong. And the nice thing about it, it creates jobs and it's fixed capital investment into, into our country. So it's certainly something that we believe should be supported. Thank you so much, Estienne. That's Estienne de Kark, who's the spokesperson for the Property Industry Group, as well as chairman of the SA REITs Association and the CEO of Growth Point South Africa. We've been talking about the opportunities and threats in the commercial property sector, uh, given the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. We are, of course, back again tomorrow evening, right here on the Pro Private Property Podcast. And tomorrow is going to be an interesting one. It's going to be a Friday. And as promised, every second Friday, we're going to be profiling different people who are making strides in the property sector and talking to them about their property journey and how they did it. You absolutely do not want to miss that one. I love the woman that we'll be speaking to story. It's quite inspiring. She's very young. She's managed to build up quite a good property portfolio and will be telling us how she's done it and some of the tips and tricks that she's learned along the way. Until tomorrow evening, hoping you're staying home and staying safe. And yeah, we'll see you again tomorrow evening. Good night. <laughs>